have and how I've structured it is more of an interactive one. So I'm going to have every slide with a, with a new type of shortage claim. And we're going to get some information out from you guys. Because most of this information has come from our field surveyors of Constellation Marine. And uh, in my view, some of these misdeclaration or shortages that are, uh, are recorded go under the radar because they go uh, in the guise of within trade limits or trade allowances. But there are enough who come slightly over the fringe <coughs> and as a result, the underwriters usually don't have uh, an answer to it. They do quantify it, they do pay up, but uh, we've gathered this information from enough underwriters who want to know more about it. And there's a lot of knowledge which is here and a lot of tricks of the trade which are here are predominantly residing in a practical field surveyor's heads. I just thought there's not enough being spoken about it, so I chose this topic. And uh, I spoke about this at a claims, Cargo Claims Conference in New Delhi a couple of uh, months ago. And I did get a lot of positive response from the field, particularly from operators of uh, vessels, of chartered vessels. So I'm going to I'm going to say that most of this is based on case studies of our Constellation Marine surveyors uh, who've been out uh, and reported back to us in our weekly meetings. But uh, I want to add to that, that uh, equity of knowledge that exists within us and ask you guys also to let us know your experiences in your day-to-day -day or your surveyors who are in your, uh, your colleagues would be adding value to this, in my view. And we hope it works. So, to get on with straight away the first uh, trick of the trade, which we've all done, and I have been guilty when I was a young cadet. I was mentored by my chief mate uh, as well how to how to probably catch uh, some tricks with the sounding tape. <laughs> So how many of you guys have, have actually, uh, as surveyors or your colleagues, have gone up and found vessels or other surveyors having messed about with the length of the sounding tape or the measuring tape? Have you all come across? We get at least one a month. At least one a month. So how it happens is, in our experience, you have the length of the tape which is cut to a certain length. And then you have the sounding on the water line or oil, which shows that there's more than actually what it is. You would think that you would catch the anomaly on the height of pipe, because in the book you would have the height of the sounding pipe as let's say 19 meters, 15 meters from the bottom. But if you have it at 18 and a half, you'd say, look, the maximum height of five is in the sounding book as X, Y, Z, but it's uh, somewhere short. Uh, but I didn't know about it in my sailing days, but in, in the practical day-to-day, -day, they have another section which adds to the sounding pipe, the sounding tape, which is outside the outside the uh, maximum loading uh, level so that adds to it and so when you're reading the height of uh, the tape it shows exactly what the height of pipe is have you all come across any of those in your day to day how often have you all come across any show of hands come across it not very often not very often all right. we, we have a team of three three surveyors and a master mariner four of them in Fujaira and at Fujaira there's a lot uh, that happens I've got a nice video coming up next, which, is, which, which explains the consequence of something like this done on a consistent basis. All our surveyors have their own sounding tapes and hydrometers with them when they go out to do simple uh, surveys. Uh, but uh, 
we all know about free surface effect. So there'll be a video which we will see on what actually it may it may end up causing the vessel to do. I calculated. Yes. Watch, watch this guy. <clears throat> I watch these ropes. You can see the flag there, which will tell you where it was, where it was. Well, free surface effect. They all thought the tanks were pressed up. But obviously, they were not. Gust of wind created her to lull, and uh, she just continued progressively listing. And then the last bit of resistance on those ropes, which were there, just gave up, and she collided. She turned over. The point being that it may have a disastrous. It's not as serious as that. But then more importantly, shortage claims uh, with oil cargo, with typically bunker vessels. We experience them mainly in, uh, in and around Fujairah. Uh, I can't say whether Singapore still has such a, such a um, trend of trick uh, that goes around. In Singapore, we don't think of the sound of trick because we start using mass flow meters. Mass flow meters. I have got, I have got, I have got a story about the tricks of the south of the of the of the of the, of the mass flow meters as well. But nevertheless. So this is the first most elementary, I think, uh, at, at the level of your cadetship you are, and you've got to start learning the skills of soldering the sounding tape closely. So the only way to overcome is, is surveyors to carry their own sounding tapes. I know it's a pain in the backside because they always got to have it in the backpacks and things like that. But this is really from that field surveyor who goes around doing very elementary surveys. Again, these shortages are not really huge shortages. Uh, and they are intentfully done by those who, who want to steal something or misdeclare something on board ships. And there's still enough companies we know of that encourage such a trend in the, uh, in the business. Oh, what did I do? Okay. These days, sounding tapes are less trendy on large... Uh, oil cargo vessels, but UTI pipes and the alterations of UTI pipes is a second close imitation of that. You can see the height of that and you can see the height of that. Now, if you take a UTI gauging initially with that height and then you start cargo operations, shorten the length of pipe and you start taking the gauging with that, you would obviously have a claim, a shortage, but you would not be able to trace it back unless your surveyor has a consciousness of keeping an eye on the length of the UTI pipe. So, so that's something that's a zero reference height that they talk about and the pipes can be altered. You know, the alteration of the initial and final alleges lead to a huge ship short discrepancy as the length is hardly verified by any surveyor before and after. And if you've not taken reference of that shortage before the operation starts, there's no way you would be having any answer towards the end of this charge to understand why the shortage. That's extremely embarrassing if a surveyor is asked what went wrong. If you go up as PNI surveyors or you've been asked to do a loss prevention, so we oversee this charge and you're not able to put a finger on why it is the shore side saying X can receive and the ship saying Y this charge and X and Y are not the same figure, you would have a surveying assignment without having an answer to the usual questions. And this might be happening repeatedly. There are enough cases where we've been asked to go there saying every time the ship comes there, there is a shortage of let's say 200 tons. We don't know why it is happening. At the load port, she's loading 10,000 tons. The charge port, she's always discharging 200 tons less, and everything else seems to be ticked and checked. That trick 
there. Somebody intentfully wants that shortage to happen and claim insurance from it. Usually, the trend happens when the the, when the buyer and the seller is of the same is the same interest, and there's an underwriter who's been asked to pay a claim and probably recover his premium for doing nothing. So zero reference height can be easily compared by lowering the UTI tape to a maximum cargo tank height or measuring the UTI pipe length to cross-check the UTI height. Correction from an approved COT calibration table can be available. So you can actually see that the, 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 the calibration certificate of the UTI gauge in that the height of pipe will be mentioned. And that's where you can actually check whether that is Oh, I wonder if okay. <laughs> put my finger on. Sorry. So that's that's uh, that's your second slide there about the UTI um, a gauge. The other thing that the UTI uh, equipment does is it, it gets the temperature. It gets the temperature. Um, indicated so that you can have the correct uh, temperature uh, correction applied when you are quantifying the cargo because density changes especially with oil cargoes i do have bulk and uh, container cargo slides as well but i'm starting with uh, the tricks of liquid cargo first and then we go on to to the bulk yeah uh, so the ship shore temperature plays an important role in ship shore discrepancies especially in petroleum product cargoes where temperature variants create a huge difference in standard net volume. So the only way to get this found out is to actually take a pot of hot water, put a thermometer, a certified thermometer, a regular thermometer, you can pick it up from, from, uh, from the medical store if you're not carrying one. I know usually in our surveyor you wouldn't have one. Uh, mercury thermometer. Just stick it there for a few minutes and then check with your, your UTI probe whether it's actually reading the right temperature if they are similar or variant and you immediately know that they're not both showing the same figure and that would be a starting point to investigate further. There's another way of cross-referencing temperatures, and usually, uh, if it's not uh, the temperature is not read with the UTI uh, gauge, there is an indicator of the temperature of cargo being shown in the cargo control room uh, uh, of the vessels, and it's on the monitors that the temperature has been displayed. And this can also be cross-referred by the UTI equipment because if you have as much as one or one and a half degree difference uh, in your cargo temperature, it would cause a, a large discrepancy at the discharge figures. Again, you cannot put a finger on it because the only time you realize that there is a shortage is after the cargo is gone. And you will have an unexplained shortage and your survey will look like Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> uh, these are part of uh, these have all come out of our weekly training. Like I said, we have ourselves made mistakes, and we've all at, at, at senior levels got into a certain job and questioned what and how we can, how can we not find out? We need answers because that's what you're hired for by a PNI club, by a ship owner, by a cargo receiver. We want to have answers, and we can't not have answers. They're all there, but it's just not obvious and it's not written enough if we don't talk about it enough. So here they are. <clears throat> Am I on the right slide? Temperature showing the right place. Okay. All right, UTIs uh, can also be lowered at the reference height to the temperature sensors to compare the actual difference of temperature. So you can just lower it to the reference height and it will pick up and you'll have you can have a guy at the at the at the tank giving you a sounding, uh, giving you a reading on the UTI temperature. It can be compared, provided the UTI gauge itself is certified. Uh, the cargo control room uh, indicators are also supposed to be calibrated, and the certificates should be available to verify it. In 
case we have challenged it, we need enough evidence to prove to whoever it is that your gauge is showing a wrong temperature reading. It has to be objective because otherwise it's your word against the vessel's word or the mate's word or the master's word and uh, they will want to uh, ignore your finding as fast as they can. <clears throat> Maintaining minimum carbo tank pressure. I mean, if I take a loaf of bread and apply a light weight on it, that bread, loaf of bread can half its size. It's just pressure on it. Exactly like that liquid as well, there is a pressurized tank or the pressure on inside of cargo tank is not recorded earlier on before the discharge and after the discharge and if it's not the same pressure or if it's not atmospheric pressure you would definitely have a wrong discharge figure and you would wonder from where that discrepancy is coming so the allege of the, of the cargo tank is not taken by minimizing the pressure in the tank, then it leads to a ship show discrepancy by not getting the actual alleges. Just the loaf of bread. If we just look at the loaf of bread, we will understand what we're talking about because uh, pressurized void in a cargo tank adds uh, a certain uh, discrepancy in the total quantity of cargo that occupies the volume. You have the right density, you'll have the right um, um, parameters of cargo, but just that it's got a little extra pressure in it, which does add to the discrepancy. And that definitely, for a large volume of, let's say, 20, 50, 1,000 tons of cargo, <laughs> definitely goes beyond the uh, trade allowance uh, or trade craft tolerance. There is a genuine shortage towards the end, and then there are protest letters flying and insurances have to pay a, 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 a certain sum. Especially when the vapor pressure of the cargo is high, as for X jet fuel and gasoline. These are the typical cargoes where such, such uh, shortages occur because you have everything shut out. But the cargo, the temperatures in the Middle East, especially in the summers, uh, you would obviously have uh, a pressure that is building without you having a good idea of it. This cargo is continuously evaporating. Shortages of liquid cargo in line quantity displacement uh, of shoreline would not be taken. You would have cargo commencing and especially in, in Fujairah where tank farms extend across the road. You have the port and the area is full up of, of storage tanks and there are times when you're actually discharging from a ship across an entire tank farm, across a highway and the tank farms on the hillside there, so you can imagine there could easily be a couple of miles of, 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 of pipeline that might be either full of cargo, usually commencement, they're, they're usually blown through and empty. But when you're taking the final figures, what comes in the tanks is different from what's discharged in, from the vessel, and, and some of it is in the pipeline. And when it goes across that distance, you would have an unexplained shortage. A normal tendency is to blow through and usually the patience level at the end of discharge operations is to not wait for maybe half an hour of blowing through, making sure all that cargo has gone back into the tanks and then the figures match, but the shore tanks will definitely show a shortage. So while doing the final calculations of the quantity being received or discharged, if the line quantity of a vessel or shoreline quantity is not taken into account, it leads to a huge ship shore dis uh, discrepancy. In the key meeting itself, the line quantity or displacement quantity should be openly discussed to avoid any delays in final calculations. Because there's always that commercial pressure and the charter sitting at the other end of the world wanting a vessel to sail out and waiting for the next lay can to be, um, to be met. We should cross refer and verify if the ship line quantity is included or excluded in the calibration tables and cargo line volumes should be accounted while carrying out final calculations. Mind you, this is in typical places uh, around the world where tank farms are very close to the vessel's berths. 
the, the line is quite short and there might not be a very large or you talk about 5 tons, 10 tons, 15 tons and uh, per cubic, sorry, and you could just forget about that shortage. It comes into, say, we don't know and we don't care, no insurance pays, so it mostly goes unnoticed. But there are enough times when we are called in to talk about these things. Again, uh, this happens with newer vessels coming into newer ports. Let's say, typically when we ask uh, a master or a mate, he'd say this is the first time I'm discharging at Fujara Oil the tanker terminal, FOTT berths. And they don't know that tanks are so far away because they don't know which tanks have been received in. So don't, they don't bother because most ports you don't bother about it. Right. <laughs> most tanker berths would have a regular hourly recording of what the ship's figure discharges and what the receivers have received. Mostly the control um, um, person or the, or, the, or the loading master from ashore will keep asking the vessel every hour as to what's your discharge quantity. Because they'll agree on a rate and they'll keep asking. Now, why is that periodic check required? Because most mates on board a vessel, especially during night times, or they would you know, kind of see this as a nag and won't understand what the hell is this every hour they're wanting us to we'll do it at the end. We'll just but cross-referring the figures from the ship and show regular in, at regular intervals leads to, a minimize, leads to minimize the ship show difference. Let's say in an hour you have a difference of one ton, and then that increases to three tons, next hour it goes to five tons, next, ton, next hour it goes to 10 tons. You know that at the end of the discharge, you're gonna probably have a 200 ton difference. So you stop cargo operations and tackle it there, try to see what the difference is, and why it is coming so. Maybe there's a while, Passing, maybe you've got two tanks discharging at this port, you've got other cargoes, while somebody has gone and just by mistake pressed another tank valve. So there's a cross valve which is probably taking the cargo, this cargo into another tank. If it happens at three or five tons, you can actually correct the situation there and then and carry on discharging it. We've, we've got that problem far more, more times than we would like it. Most of the time, the grades are different. And if one grade is pissing into the other grade, you, don't, you not only have a shortage claim, you have cross-contamination as well, and an off-spec cargo at the, at the other port as well. And a lot of underwriters have appreciated the fact of us being proactive in doing so. <clears throat> if a high discrepancy is observed, uh, the cargo operation should be suspended and should be investigated as a matter uh, or reason of this frequency we discussed. So that I mentioned, it's along the way and we should be talking about it when the frequency is still small and the cross-contamination potential is low. <coughs> uh, interlinked tanks, I briefly mentioned in the last slide, interlinked tanks, extremely important. There are always cross double valve segregations these days between tanks. There is a line going this way. You have one grade loaded on one side of the vessel other uh, grade loaded on the other side of the vessel. There are cross walls, cross lines going. If you if you imagine a zigzag of lines underneath the tanks uh, of, of vessels, you would imagine that uh, there's a potential of anything going. Especially when you're you're putting a a finger and opening a hydraulic valve within minutes, it's it's triggering out something. Point being that all it takes is a small leaking seat of one of the two segregated valves, and by mistake you're pressing the second one. And it'll 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 start triggering a small leak. So all interrelated cargo tanks should be checked prior commencing of cargo and after completion of cargo. Alleged and temperatures should thoroughly be checked, and change of trim correction should be applied to obtain the correct observed value. Alleged reports should be prepared initially and finally witnessed by a responsible officer of the vessel and the terminal jointly. Now, <clears throat> I know I've been just putting slides through, but I'll take a small pause at this stage. Uh, and I know Singapore is quite dominant with the oil in and out <clears throat> that, uh, that go on. But if, is any of this making sense? Are you all having uh, any of these experiences? Mark? What's that tanker? 
you're a tank commander for so you're, you're making some sense to you what I'm saying. I'm glad. And it happens. It happens, yeah. Uh, and at the end of it, the master sends out or the vessel goes away with putting a protest letter saying I've discharged according to ship figures, etc., etc. But then, uh, you know, the mess is out uh, for us to clean up and and we are trying to discuss it with the terminals, trying to reason it out with the club, saying that really it wasn't the ship that that uh, that had the shortage or is the show figure wrong. Yeah, anybody <coughs> else? Thank you, man. How many thank you, man? Yeah. So far? What about you, sir? Same? Making sense? Good. Just a quick survey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite um, bound by my trade of uh, making a reference check quickly. Can I ask you, you know, yeah. In Kadara, you have the Kadara 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 Kadara. Yeah, mm, yeah. That's one of the things about the camera, isn't it? <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, don't ask me the effectiveness. I will not be able to comment. As as diplomatic as I can get. Because but it's not as, yeah. I know it is. I know it is. But you can raise a complaint with the, the Fujaira uh, authorities. We do have Federal Transport Authority as the watchdog there. Uh, and uh, uh, the Fujaira oil terminal is a government storage facility. May I say any more? Uh, <laughs> uh, there are private players. There is uh, there is a Wopac terminal. There is Gulf Petrochem uh, tank farms, etc. In uh, Jabalali, the Star uh, terminal. So, so there are private players who who have uh, uh, this storage facility. But uh, you know, it's just ignorance of how things might just turn up. Uh, we have got three vitamin tanks uh, from uh, Imal, uh, Emirates Aluminium. They, they receive vitamin. We survey all the shipments that are com in, coming in. And uh, out of the three tanks, two are not calibrated recently. And they've got such a sludge deposit that there's always uh, uh, a discrepancy in uh, the final ship show figure. And there are n number of protests, n number of things. It just goes unnoticed and eventually somebody pays somebody a shortage claim. But, you know, we're happy that way. Yeah, as surveyors, uh, having some employment and these stories to tell in conferences far away from home. And then, is there any way we can blank it or something? Right? <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is out there, it's quite common knowledge. <clears throat> undeclared tank and cargo lines inside cargo tanks to obtain undeclared cargo quantities. This is such a difficult one to track. Now, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but if you imagine this room to be one of the bunker tank uh, tanks, bunker, bunker, the tanker that bunkers ship to ship, and if you imagine this little projector box being welded inside, or maybe this table, <coughs> size of the table being welded inside this big cargo tank, stand alone like this, with a small pipe going out and coming in. And there's a pump outside this room, which has just got a switch on and off, which fills in oil from this tank into this small void. So when a ship comes in, the bunker, this is empty. You sound the tanks, you get a certain level. When she goes out, that's full. Of 20 tons. No soundings, no tracks, nothing. It's got an overflow pipe, so this tank, the pump remains on for let's say two hours, three hours. This will fill up of 20 tons and excess oil will just go back into the big tank, which was taken from there anyways. Then you finish this tank, you come around, you take your soundings, the tank is empty, everything, but the receiving vessel has received 20 tons short. Where's that oil gone? Mr. Bunker Surveyor, you don't know where the oil is gone. What job are you doing? And that to do. When you open up, stick a, uh, stick a, a torch in, and have a look inside from the manhole on top. You probably see a structure that's sticking out of the bottom of the tank, and you'd ask, 
uh, the, the, them the question as to what is that. It looks like you can't take a picture, you don't have any objective evidence, the atmosphere is too dangerous, but at least you've seen it and you can leave a report, a line in the report that there probably is a line tank within tank. And then you start looking around that tank and you probably see a small fuel pump outside, which is actually retrofitted for the purpose of steering. Imagine every vessel they're going to, they're they are taking away that back to base. When this vessel gets, when this tank gets filled up with new bunkers to, to, to supply to another, to another tank, <coughs> that oil is pumped back into the big tank and it's again emptied. And so nobody has any interference. You never physically go in. It's just the reverse pump. You either pump it this way or this way. It either empties or it pulls in. The, the pumping out um, uh, of the pipe is usually at the bottom of the of such a tank. So it actually sucks out to the end. Anyway, I have undeclared been, tanks, yes. I had a few years, quite some years back here in Singapore, the bunker barge, whereby they hang all the rooms on the tank block. Hang? Yeah, they were, they were with the chain block, and the oil drums were hanging on to the end top, and they lower them down. The level goes up, you do the sounding, they come up, and then you have the volume of the of the oil drums you have to you have a boss. Yeah, we, we haven't come across, but that's clever. You don't even need a pipe to. You don't need. Have... <laughs> <laughs> well, th there have been many cases, uh, and uh, I'll tell you, I personally found this out with one of the vessels because I was called in audaciously to, to give out a, a gas-free certificate. The vessel was being refurbished in in, in one of the dry docks in Dubai, and. Uh, I was trying to figure out why am I issuing a hot work uh, in, in, in a work to be done in a bunker tank. I said, are there any pipes going inside? I said, no. Are there any cracks? No. I said, what are you going to weld? I need to know because I need to see whether that area is safe or things. It was a, it was a, you know, a cleaned up tank. I went in to see if everything was fine, took all the gas meters and everything. But I was not told till the end what the damn job was. Why were they wanting to weld inside a bunker tank? And if it was not steel renewals, what was it? So I made a surprise visit in the evening to see what was going on. And I said, I'm not going to charge anybody anything, but I just feel like coming up. I issued the, the gas-free certificate and the hot work. In, in Dubai, in UAE, you have a third party to inspect safety and then issue a certificate so that the outside contractors can, cannot carry on doing the job. Even in dry docks, there. When I went there, there were two or three uh, of these raised up with a little angled uh, support to it. And I said, "What's that you welding?" Because I've issued a hot work permit, and they didn't tell me. So come and see. And that's when one of the welders said, oh, "We've been told to make a tank with this much, by this much, this much, by this much inside, with a little overflow, and that's it. Nothing else, and we've got to go away." So I just took a few pictures and went away from there. And I, I, I told our boys, it was none of my business because it wasn't a claim at that stage. But when that bunker barge came out in the fields, we were watching her closely and we've caught a few hands uh, trying to play the trick. Again, bunkering is such a dirty <laughs> business. And, and in my view, I hope there are no bunker traders here. Anybody? <laughs> I don't mind saying that. But bunkering, uh, I was told yesterday after my golf game that uh, this particular client of ours, the charterer, he buys fuel globally at $68 minus the FOB price, the wire price, at 68 tons below the uh, dollars below the wire price. And FOB minus 40 is apparently the trend. You have a you have a bunker wire which fluctuates. There's a cargo index which goes somewhere lower, minus 40 is apparently the trend. Forget that he's buying it at $68, minus 68. I couldn't believe him when he said that. I said, you're actually inducing theft culture in the physical supplier's way of trading. If he's selling at minus $68 a ton, where is he going to make his money from? Obviously by short supply. He's going to steal something from somewhere, pump some water with the cargo, something of the sub. He's not. He's got to make a profit of it. Anyway, magic pipes. 
<clears throat> see the little small thing? That's just to increase the uh, or decrease the the level of uh, oil in the in the in the in the tanks. And usually, if if, if you if you got a, a tank that's sounded there and your bob just stops there instead of stopping there, you easily make out the reference uh, height difference before and after. And all they have to do is lower a piece of metal into the sounding pipe. And your bob just sticks, stays there with a small string attached, and then you pick it up. I know magic pipes are referred to uh, with the with the oily water separator, but in our world of soundings, there are also magic pipes. <clears throat> so the magic pipe, the sounding may mislead the cargo surveyor by providing wrong knowledges of cargo, which may be cross-checked by lowering the sounding tape into the maximum reference height of the cargo tank. Empty cargo tanks can be initially checked and can be compared to the calibration table for total height reference of the respective cargo oil tank. To find out if any obstructions, obstruction has been provided intentionally into the sounding pipe. I must say, recent year or two years, we haven't found much of this. We is easily it can be easily found out with with the reference sites or, uh, mentioned in the sounding pipe. So it's, it's not very common, but there are still uh, um, optimists on board ships who try the luck with it. How are we? All right. Ten, 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 ten. Um, vessels experience factor not taken into account. We go up to ten vessels behind for getting vessel experience factor. Vessel experience factor is simply the coating of the of the paint or paint over paint. The, the 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 volume available in the vessel is less. Sometimes there are some structural modifications, strengthening old vessels usually. So when you get uh, around recording up to ten uh, vessel experience factors, you would get some indication of what it is. So the vessel experience factor should be taken in in into account when it is fully loaded for maximum for maximum cargo, and this may reduce the ship shore discrepancy. Prior commencement of the cargo transfer, vessel, uh, vessel experience factors should be counted and same should be applied while doing the final calculation. Same vessel experience factor. We should keep a note when and where <coughs> there is a huge discrepancy of cargos. There, are, there may be some, where, some ports where they, regularly they might have a large discrepancy. There might not be, uh, that there might not be uh, relevant to as a vessel experience factor. Let's say out of 10, they might have suddenly uh, had a shortage of a larger quantity at certain ports and you go back to see if she's repeatedly discharged at the similar port. Again, the same discharge difference may occur. So that might not be because of the vessel experience factor and other, other reasons why you there. Uh, which cargo tanks this, uh, these discrepancies occur to uh, occur into that is important as well because there might be a vessel experience factor tank wise that might be separate. Now that's going a little too much into it, but I'm just saying there is a possibility of a discrepancy. And usually we don't we don't take into uh, account that. Coming back to bunkers, and this is something is existing in in Singapore still the cappuccino effect. If you order a cappuccino at an very decent Italian restaurant uh, or, or a cafe and stick your finger in, you probably get a sounding of coffee, make sure it's not too hot though, uh, of coffee probably as deep as your finger is. But if you let it settle for a half an hour, you suddenly realize that the coffee is actually only half the class. <laughs> That's exactly what happens uh, with, with cargo uh, and bunker tanks. They they actually induce air. There is a pneumatic pipe, they connect it, and when the, the, and the vessel is receiving bunkers, it also receives air bubbles along with the cargo that it takes. And all those air bubbles find their way up, form the nice little cappuccino froth effect, and you dip your sounding or your alledge, you think it is up there. We have enough charters calling us and telling us that <coughs> the vessel's got to go, finish your survey within the next two hours, 
the bunker traders come back and said, this is the time of completing bunkers. We've got to go and catch this loading and so and so forth. We call up the bunker desk who's appointed us and say, we know there is, there is froth induced. This typical vessel, this particular master has got, and it's a small hole, a small nut at the, in, the, in the discharge line. They remove the nut, put a small little pipe and start the compressor and just keep putting air bubbles in. And just So you let it settle down, let's say six hours later, you take another sounding, keep the bunker barge alongside or tell them to go away and we'll give them a check their evidence of what we've got. In the worst case scenario, and we hate to do this, but there have been some audacious cases where we ask them to open the manuals of the vessel, uh, of the bunker tanks, if they're available easily, stick a small little bucket and pull out the froth, take a few pictures on deck and tell them, this is what this tank has on the top, let's say half a meter or so and it's not bunker oil. So cappuccino froth is very common in bunker industry. To increase the bunker figures, which can be easily avoided by using competent bunker surveyors and enough times to be given for the settling of the cappuccino froth if observed to get actual hullages. Flow meters can be used to avoid bunker discrepancy. Uh, blowing of lines may not be permitted prior to carrying out hullages. Same would be discussed in the key meeting prior to operation. I touched very slowly on, on the flow meters and I know being in Singapore, I can't do justice to this without talking about flow meter tricks. One of the most common ones are when the, when the, when the flanges are together, if you, if you don't, if your, if your surveyor is not looking at the flanges coming together, you will see a small pipe with an opening in the direction of where the flow is going. And that pipe will have a U-turn, come back, and it's again pouring the oil in, in the floor. So, I mean, the diameter changes as to how much they want to steal. But there are different holes in the flanges, and there are going around and the measuring or quantifying some of the oil which is going. And the rates are different. At different flow rates, you get different uh, uh, discrepancy figures. And you would you would have everything else in place, but the quantity received inside your ship's tank would be much lesser. We've also heard of some people using powerful magnets kept under the U-bend of the, of, the, of the flow meters and that uh, keeps the, the, the flow rate, it tosses it off, but it, it, it's not kept consistently. Kept there for 20 minutes, half an hour, so that the, the, there's an anomaly in the figures and they pull it back. And then we don't know where it is, but they know in what direction the magnet should be kept in, against the floor, towards the floor, and that makes the figures skewed. I say no more about the bunker trade, but there is enough in the trick, enough tricks in the trade. Yes, sir. You must say, I, I mean, 15 years in Singapore. Yes. Many bunker days. Yeah. And before January 2017, we have basically with every single birthday in the past year. Every birthday. Yeah. Since January 2017, our claims has reduced almost to zero. So there is, in my opinion, from my personal experience, there's an incredible improvement with the past year. I, I believe so as well. I am fully I'm fully in favor of it. If you're taking a you know a 300 quid uh refueling of your car, you have, you never doubt how much quantity is coming into your, in your car tanks. It is properly regulated. You have absolutely no doubt what number has been shown on the digits there. You pay up and walk away. Why is it when you're taking thousands of dollars of fuel, the simple technique may not be. It's because the traders don't want it. And the traders don't want it because the physical suppliers have been given the free hand and the liberty are encouraged short supply because the traders are selling such low rates below the purchase price and the recent trend I've seen is they're actually going and discussing with the, the, the physical per buyer of the of the bunkers to match cargo indexes no longer bunker wire price and and bunker uh, and cargo cargo prices are actually uh, for only 50,000 tons or more if you're purchasing a uh, cargo parcel of 50,000 tons of crude or gasoline, only then the cargo index is applied. 
even for short quantities, if you're directly discussing with the physical supplier, bypass the broker and his uh, atrocities. Enough physical suppliers are giving you a rate directly, which is very close to the cargo index. Now, this is completely commercial. It's nothing to do with surveying, but I'm just letting you know if you have the decision making ability, this may be relevant. I'm not touching it. I'll leave it here to play. <coughs> I moved to bulk, but I, before I do that, I want to show you a video which recently happened in one of my home country ports. Now you can see there the freeboard is reducing as she's making way. Sorry, my way. Anyway. That guy's brave. That guy's really brave. He's still hope. Now he gives up. <laughs> uh, it's heartbreaking to actually see a ship sink. Uh, being a being a master mariner, I tell you, that's the worst nightmare. She's still making way. She's still making way. The engines are not giving up. There must be German engines. <laughs> All right. I think there, there, there's one there, there's one there, there, there's no loss of life, it's happened a couple of weeks ago, but if you would have noticed, the cargo pile somewhere in the, uh, uh, in the aft section was a nice little pile and I was told she was carrying fertilizer and they just didn't bother about trimming, they didn't know they're supposed to trim. The forward hold was absolutely light, don't know why they didn't distribute the load, but that probably was one of the reasons. She went down. Well, coastal trade. Uh, we know uh, the ship owners who, who run these in the in the coastline. But um, the reason of showing you this uh, as a as a bulk cargo discrepancy is a lot of times people do not understand or know how much cargo is in which cargo holds. We get a lot of grain cargo that comes into the Middle East with different grades in different holes. And um, <coughs> they tell us hold number three and hold number six are for this port. But inevitably, when you do the draft survey and the receivers give you their silo figures, there's a shortage. The final draft survey, cargo parcel A plus cargo parcel B ends up to be, let's say, 50,000 ton. It is 50,000 ton. Port A, you're discharging 20,000, but there is no 20,000 in three and six old. Number three and six old. So you can't, unless you have at the load port number three hold and number five hold loaded, a draft survey done, made sure that the cargo has come and then carried on. There's no way you can find out. Usually there are two sprouts coming from two, uh, two, two silos loading simultaneously in different holds, and there's no way you can quantify. At the load port, which hold has how much? You rely on the on the on the on the shore figures for it. Yeah, finish. I've got one page more. So bulk cargoes. <coughs> there's another trend of coal sulfur. They usually sprinkle water on it. Or in uh, places like India, Indonesia, where uh, iron ore piles are exposed to rain, and there's always a uh, a uh, uh, misdeclaration on moisture content. You take the cargo, you know there is water coming with iron ore cargo or in coal it's sprinkled on top and sulfur it's sprinkled on top to reduce spontaneous or uh, minimize spontaneous combustion. Now all that water in the voyage settles to the bilge, bilge wells. If you don't consider the bilge pumping log or the vessel doesn't log the bilge pumping log, you would have pumped out some cargo, uh, some water which would have been quantified as cargo in the final draft survey figures. And then when you come at the receiving port, you've got shortage. Not only is it shortage by discharging its notice when the, when the, when the ore or the, or the coal is actually reaching them, the, the steel plant, it's further draining down because it continues, the water continues to settle out. So when they actually receive the ores at the thing, there's a huge discrepancy or it goes up to 12%, 15% of the total cargo quantity that's received. And somebody's paying somebody for money. And then there is a PNI claim on shortages, 
and it's unexplained. It's all to do with either being noticed at the load port or en route to the voyage and, and retrieving the cargo, uh, pumping, the bilge pumping log en route. Loss of dead weight, it's called. <coughs> Direct comparison of midship drafts on both the sides leading to discrepancy. We, 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 we usually encourage our surveyors to go down on the offshore side, down the vertical ladder. And when there are two or three parties doing a survey, trust me, everyone's looking at their face. Who's going to be the miserable guy who's going to go down the ladder and read those drafts and come back and tell everybody else what it is. And usually the poor mate he looks at it as his duty to go down. But when we send our boys in on the offshore side, we usually encourage them to read the drafts themselves because then they have the control on the entire operation. I'm not telling you that we tell them to read the drafts wrong, but at least they are sure that they have seen the drafts themselves. Pilferage of cargo in container ships, and it is my last slide and then the video to finish it. Now, <laughs> container, well, containers and cargo within the containers, there is a, a fantastic video online on YouTube. I didn't have the copyright to get it, but I have the link. I can share it with you guys. There's a very nice technique of removing the bolts, keeping the seal intact, and getting whatever you want from outside. Usually in, in the Middle East, we have perfumes, laptops, um, uh, mobile phones as these three most favorite commodities of the dock rats. I don't know where the dock rats are. We usually think they are in the load ports itself because when the, the containers are sealed in the, the shipper's yard and they get verified along the way and come in. Uh, a, a fantastic one we did is 100 containers going from Jabalali to to a, 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 a West Bengal or, or, a, or, or a Bangladesh port. I don't remember which one it was. It was noticed for a shortage of car, uh, less weight in, 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 in Columbia, uh, Colombo. The customs inspected it. All 100 containers was declared to have wax in it, industrial wax. So they're having sandbags in each sandbag, all 100 of them. Not shortest claim, it was really just this chip. So, pilferage of valuable cargoes at load port or discharge port on, uh, in, in, on container vessels. It used to be a very, very predominant uh, trade when I was sailing on container ships. I know of it. This has, lead, this has led to many discrepancies. Even the container has been found, even though the container has been found sealed due to mismanagement of representatives and authorities and some ports should be immediately brought to the notice of the parties. There are ways to identify whether the bolts are removed, the, the, the locking handles are just twisted and easily opened up, seal remains intact, and then they're closed back. And uh, the, 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 the doors shut down. This is something that Ton Boss will be very, very heartbroken to see. <laughs> Being a heavy lift expert. This is just to add a little flavor to it. Nothing to do with shortage claims, but it does have a storyline of the, the straps being absolutely wrongly certified for safe working load. These were really old straps, I was told, and uh, they had a certificate which said safe working load X, Y, and Z, which you seem to be suitable by the surveyor who attended uh, to lift it without actually challenging it. I mean, if you've been on the field far enough and done enough warranty surveys, somebody tells you those straps were good for 50 tons safe working load, you look at it and say, I've seen a few 50 ton straps and they don't look anything like this. There's something missing somewhere there. And you should be challenging it. I know it is not shortage claims, but it is misdeclaration of weights. And there are enough certifying bodies or companies which I can tell you at least exist in the Middle East region will give you a piece of certificate on loose gear, which will have all sorts of numbers in it without having any 
justification for it. So thank you very much. Uh, you're not an IMS member already. I've been very, uh, <laughs> very cheeky to give you the link. You can download the form there. And only if you are smart, qualified, and a professional surveyor or a surveying firm, bother about it. Otherwise, carry on without being a member. How's <laughs> that? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.